So after talking about the system context, next we talk about system boundaries. If we're going back to our figure where we have the system in the middle and the system context surrounding the system, the system boundary is the border between system and the system context. And the system boundary defines the scope of the development of your project, where you are supposed to lead the requirements engineering process. An example to get you like a little bit of a feeling of where, why the system boundary is relevant is given below. So if a credit card payment system is developed as a part of the system, it is within the system boundary, so it's part of your system. If an existing credit card payment system is reused or like an external one is used, it is outside of the system boundary, so it's in the system context. And there is also a more formal definition of a system boundary, which is the system boundary separates the system to be developed from the system context. The system boundary separates the parts that belong to the system and can hence be changed during the development process from the part of the system context that cannot be changed during the development process. And there are various influences on the system boundaries that are relevant. So this is pretty much the same figure that you've seen before, just adding some more context here for the system context. In the middle, we have still the system and influences on the system boundary could be business processes that are relevant for your system. It could be software systems that you have to use. It could be documents uh, like law directives or standards that you have to adhere to. But it could also be hardware systems if you think back to uh, the calculator example that we talked about before. And interfaces are an important part of the system boundaries. Usually you have two types of interfaces. First, sources who provide input for the system. And second, things used to receive output from the system. Possible sources uh, and things could be groups of stakeholders, existing systems. Interfaces are used not only for monitoring the environment, but also to provide functionalities to the uh, environment, to influence parameters of the environment and to control operations of the environment. So essentially this game or like where, where both of them interact with each other. There are also different interface types that are relevant. So sources and sinks require various interfaces, depends on the functionality of the source and the sink. Some common examples are human machine interfaces, like a mouse, a keyboard, touchscreen, emergency switch, or just simply a presenter for slides. Um, another alternative or other types are, are hardware interfaces like SD card slots, USB ports, storage in general. And you also have software interfaces like libraries that you're using during the development process, uh, web services and others. The interfaces may impose constraints, so they may be limit what you should do or can do, but the interfaces may also be sources of requirements. So you can get constraints as well as requirements from the interfaces. And the development of the boundary is a process that takes a while, because when you start the process, most likely not all elements of the system boundary are known. Interfaces might be known or might be unknown. There also might be some desired functionalities that are not known yet. Therefore, the system boundary is often not defined until the end of the requirements engineering process. That leads to something that we often refer to as a gray zone between the system and the context. System boundaries may shift within that gray zone. The gray zone itself may also shift, but this is very important. At the end of the requirements engineering process, there should be no gray zone left. If you still have a gray zone left, you're not done yet. So after talking about the system context and the system boundary, we're gonna talk about the context boundary next. If we're going back to our figure, the context boundary separates the system context from the irrelevant environment. And it distinguishes between what is relevant for the requirements engineering process and what is not. Similar to the system boundary, it may shift and have a gray zone, but the most important part for you is to figure out okay, what's relevant for my project and what is not. In contrast to the system boundary, the context boundary is 
more difficult to properly define. Some say it's actually impossible or virtually impossible. Sometimes it's unclear whether an aspect belongs to the system context or not, cannot always be resolved during the requirements engineering process. It is possible that after the requirement engineering process is completed, there's still a gray zone in the context, different from the system context where the gray zone is resolved. That doesn't mean that you can just say, look, um, the gray zone is quite big, I don't care. Try to get it as small as possible. How do you document the system context and the boundaries? Often through natural languages. Diagrams are also very useful. You could use use case diagrams where you have actors and their usage relationships to the systems. Data flow diagrams often help to get you an idea about sources and sinks and the flow of data between them. And there's typically a mixture of several documentation forms, something that we'll get back to in the general concepts of documenting your requirements later on.